Today, we're joined by Bernardo Colvallo, CEO and Chief Happiness Officer of The Bridge Social, a digital staffing and recruitment network for IT talent. Uh, great to have you here today, Bernardo. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for the invitation. Great to contribute again with Nearshore Americas. Great. So, Bernardo, um, how would you characterize the significance of Latin America and the Caribbean in the global tech industry search to supply the talent the world needs? Well, I think it's crucial, really, uh, looking at uh, Latin America. It would be silly not to uh, when you take into account the fact that uh, there is a huge talent pool. We're talking about uh, millions of habitants and certainly hundreds of thousands of professionals in Latin America. Um, and they are at the same or very similar time zone as the US, correct? So uh, for the US market, for the Central American and the local market in Latin America, it would make absolute sense to look very carefully and understand what are the key opportunities. Of course, it's not a no man's land. Uh, but it's also not Sweden, right? So you have to understand the limitations and the opportunities of each uh, country, each market. Uh, it's super important also to understand the cultural differences, currency differences, legal and tax differences. However, uh, there is a, a massive opportunity for those who manage to cut through the red tape and cut through the, the language issues, right? So there's a, there's a few challenges, but of course, uh, if you live and breathe it like us and, uh, and you make sure that you are connected with each market, each reality, and you have people that truly understand uh, where are the gaps and where are the, the little gold nuggets, then sure, you can definitely uh, take a, a great advantage of, uh, of, the, of the local market for sure. Bernardo, you talked about um, hidden golden nuggets. What are some of the innovative ways you're seeing companies unearthing this hidden talent? Well, Peter, if I answered you that, I will have to kill you. No, I'm kidding. Of course I will answer. There's a lot of uh, hidden treasures out there. Um, and there's a lot of, let's say, techniques, methodologies, tools, and strategies that one can use to, to dig out the talent, right? So um, some... Some examples are no, not so innovative. Uh, companies seem to look for the silver bullet, right? What is the magic thing that I can do that's just going to rain developer CVs on my, on my inbox and my recruitment team is going to send me, you know, dozens of uh, perfect CVs. And that's, that's just not uh, the correct mindset, right? The, the mindset really is... I think using the analogy of the nuggets is you have to know where to look and how to look for it, right? Uh, so that the, the, those little shiny things come out. They're never going to rain. It's never going to rain gold ever. But of course, if you go to the right place and you know how to search, then you will find the gold, of course. So uh, what I try to explain to people in a more holistic view, instead of saying to you, use this or that tool, because it, it is different, right? It depends on the type of role you're looking for, the more senior, more junior. It depends on the type of company you are, what the challenges are, for example. Some companies do get a lot of applications. If you talk about Microsoft, I mean, they get hundreds of curriculums, right? So they will benefit from, if the problem is having too many, then uh, you can use in, uh, RPA and in, in artificial intelligence to filter through the big volume of curriculums, right? If you have difficulty further down the funnel where you need to actually know how to evaluate the professionals and understand how good they are technically, then there's amazing tools like HackerRank and Test Gorilla. However, they are not so, they're not so cheap. They're quite generic. They might not fit your business needs when it comes to choosing a developer or a UX or a data scientist. Uh, so in reality, what we find is there is the you need to find the right combination of tools and strategies for you that works for you. It needs to suit your budget. It needs to suit the maturity of your business, the maturity of your team. For example, if you have nobody that is a, a senior uh, validator, developer, architect, or a CTO, then you're definitely going to need a really good advanced tool. And you, 
you should probably pay for it, right? Something like hacker rank or test gorilla. But um, if you do have those skills in house, then perhaps it's better off for you to, to create your own validation methods, right? You create your own because you will be able to customize it. Yes, you can customize hacker rank and test gorilla for a, a certain, to a certain level, right? But if you have experts, then I would suggest for you to try to create a more customized assessment so that you can choose the, the best people for your, for your company. Consider the culture fit, of course. Consider other factors, not just the technical side. And again, it's not one tool that's going to give you that, right? So you need to do the, the cultural assessment. You need to do language. You need to consider different factors. And, like and the bridge social itself has grown rapidly, um, especially over the last couple of years. You know, I've got a few hundred uh, employees. Um, Within a quickly growing company, how important and how easy is it to uh, cement a kind of a strong cultural foundation, um, and particularly within the international context? Absolutely, Peter. Uh, well, building a culture uh, of a startup culture and a innovation culture and also a caring culture, right? My title is Chief Happiness Officer. Why, why, why is that? I didn't want to be just CEO because just CEO, as if it wasn't enough, right? It's already a tough job, but I've given myself a, a double job here. Uh, why is that? Because I wanted to remind myself from the beginning what is our purpose, what is our mission, what is my mission as a company and as a, and as a employee and as the founder of the company is to make sure that the candidates are happy, the clients are happy, the other companies, right, who hire talents via the bridge, and that our employees are happy, right? So our team, the, pe the people who are outsourced, the clients, uh, and, the, and the recruitment team, everybody, they need to be happy, right? We need to create an environment of safety. We need to create an environment where people are motivated to really come up with the best side, right? Really, of course, there can be competition. And for example, we have commissions. We pay commissions to recruiters. We pay commissions to salespeople. It's competitive. It's tough. It's not easy working at the bridge. You have to, you are expected to work a lot, but it's not because you you work a lot and you have a startup mentality and there is an urgency uh, and there is little resources because we're not a multi-billion-dollar company. But it's not because of that they have an excuse to have a bad culture. And the funny thing is, I literally just watched the five episodes of the Uber series that is on Showtime, which is fantastic, uh, and also the WeWork uh, uh, documentary that is uh, actually available, I don't know where, because I've downloaded it, uh, but you can basically see the story of Adam Newman, right? The CEO who crashed and burned horribly, and is the 47 billion uh, startup, I think it's called, and it went from 47 to 8 billion in terms of valuation. So these were really toxic cultures. They were very uh, discriminatory against women. They were uh, burnout cultures. They were cultures of, uh, you know, typical unicorn startup. But the, te but the problem, the main problem was that the CEOs, uh, they... Uh, talked about these missions, they talked about the vision, but in the end, they were only looking after themselves. They were only looking after their own interests, right? And they were, uh, they had personalities that were quite uh, difficult to to manage, right? So for the for the investors, right? So the investors invested a lot of money in these companies, and they had a leadership that were uh, basically young white guys who were uh, absolutely terrible at uh, actually uh, creating an environment where people could really excel and, and, and do their best, right? Do their best work and uh, not diverse at all, the, 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 the environments. And uh, of course, on speech, yes, they want to change the world, etc. But at the end, uh, it wasn't, that, that wasn't the, the real motivation. It became clear afterwards, right? Um, so, of course, uh, these are high-performance uh, cultures, and we are a high-performance culture. We demand a lot from our people. But on the other hand, we also take huge steps and invest money and invest time and invest a lot of uh, brain power on creating a place where people uh, are challenged, 
but where they feel challenged, but not because of their sex, their race, or their level of experience. They feel challenged because they are at the bridge and everyone is going to feel challenged because we want to achieve great things. However, we make sure that uh, people have a voice. We make sure that uh, the decisions are made along with other people. We reward people for their results. We work strongly with OKRs. We use a, a tool called Culture Rocks, uh, Culture with a Q. It's a Brazilian tool, but it's already in other languages. And we track the OKR of everyone. Everyone has OKRs and everyone has uh, key targets. Like I said, we have also commissions and bonuses that go most of the time beyond what the industry normally offers. Um, we've, we align the interests, right? So that everyone is rowing in the same direction, right? And now, of course, the OKRs help with that. But for example, the, the bonuses that I pay for the leadership team, they are aligned with my key objectives as CEO and the key objectives as the company and the key objectives of the investors. Right, so we have the same direction. Everyone is going in the same direction. Nobody has personal interests that can overcome the general interests of the company, right? Um, Perfect. Um, and then, you know, Bernardo, you, you, you touched upon uh, Uber and we work there, I think, and the uh, forms of, you know, forms of kind of toxic leadership effectively. Um, Ego obviously plays a large role in that, and ego plays a plays a role in all companies, particularly at the you know executive, executive level. Um, so, how, as a CEO of a you know a vastly growing startup, how do you keep that ego in check, and how much of a part does the ego play in the success of a of a startup? Do you think? Well, I think Peter, uh, the funny thing about ego, it's is that everyone has it. Some people just have more than others, right? Or some people just show their ego, right? Portray their ego more than others. So I think the key point that most uh, of us need to, to realize is first, be humble enough to admit that you have an ego, right? Because uh, it's the society. Society has taught you from the beginning that uh, you need to value yourself, that you need to be better, that you are respectful, and it's part of uh, self-love as well, ego, right? Ego doesn't have to be a, a negative thing as long as you can control it, right? As long as you can control it. It's like uh, greed, right? If you don't have any greed at all, none, then you, you're never going to work, right? You're never going to get paid. You're never going to, because you have to have a little bit of, of greed. And then maybe it's not greed, maybe it's, it's called something else. Ego, maybe it's self-respect, right? If you call it uh, if, if you have a little bit of it. So don't try to eliminate the ego because it's important that you take care of yourself and you value yourself. However, of course, uh, and that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about when, uh, when the, the ego gets out of hand, right? The, the issue is when you lose control of your ego. So my key lesson, and I'm no expert because I have an ego and it's not a small one, so I think uh, I'm not going to pose you as a no ego guy, right? Because uh, I worked in advertising and marketing for many years, and boy, do they have egos, right? Do we have egos, right? So the first thing is admit that you have one, right? Admit that you have one. Don't try to not have any ego, I guess. So these are the two first lessons. And then from then on, it's a matter of working with it. Right? You have the little thing here talking on your ear and the one talking on the other ear, the good and the bad, right? So if you know when to listen to the bad one and okay, I understand, and then when to listen to the because if you just listen to the good one, then it's, it's terrible. I mean you get you get run over in business, right? You can't just be the nice the nicest person in the world and run a stuffy business, okay? I'm sorry, it's not gonna happen. I mean, you're gonna get completely destroyed because it's a tough business, right? It's a global challenge. We're talking about dealing with people. We're talking about dealing with big clients, competition, etc., etc. Any business is difficult, but staffing is, is not different from, from any other. So you need to, I think it's important to have a personality and to have 
and to be strong and to defend your point of view, right? So that's the part where you need to listen to the band and listen to your ego. And sometimes you have to put your foot down. You have to say, look, it is how it is. I'm sorry, I can't go any further than this. I'm doing the best I can for you, right? But I think uh, when people have uh, out of control egos, it's mainly a result of a deep insecurity, of course. I think that's the key cause. Uh, and I'm not a psychologist uh, at all, of course. I haven't studied that. Uh, I haven't even done a lot of psychology. But I have seen clearly that uh, when you are faced with someone that is a person that is very insecure, it's a high probability that that person will have uh, less control of their ego, right? Because their emotions are all kind of modeled up inside. They think that you are trying to cause them damage, right? They they think they, they, they can't defend themselves that well because they are insecure. So they are fragile, right? They are open. It's kind of, they are not protected by confidence. So if you're not confident and you're insecure, then your reaction uh, often re, uh, comes out, you know, as, as, a, as an egotistical reaction because you are protecting, you're defensive, you're thinking about yourself. You're not putting yourself in other person's shoes. When you are confident and you're solid and you don't, you're not such influenced by out, uh, outside perspective and outside opinion and outside judgment, then you are solid, right? So then you can put yourself in the other person's shoes because it's not affecting you what the person is saying, right? Or what is happening around you that much. It is affecting you, but it's under control. Lastly, uh, Bernardo, um, moving back on to the theme of recruitment, what do you see uh, ahead as the kind of major milestones for for recruitment in the, in the borderless world, um, borderless work future? Sure. Well, it's funny. I mean, I was looking at some data from Gartner and they projected that all employees worldwide would be remote by end of 2021. So this is from last year. And 51% of knowledge employees, as we know, the IT, for example, is a key knowledge employee uh, generator, right? 51% uh, will be remote, right? So 50, half of the world of the knowledge economy will be remote, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this is absolutely incredible. Uh, I mean, a lot of people were already remote before the pandemics, and uh, and so many people now are just so happy to be remote and they're never going to come back, right? There's no way. If you try to make them come back, you're just going to lose them for another company, especially if you're talking about a market like the IT market, right, Peter? So, in terms of the the, the recruitment point of view, I think that's part of the challenge. You need to look at your whole, uh, like uh, Josh Burson says, you know, the great guru of uh, X Deloitte, and now he's got his own company again. Uh, it's all about your human capital management strategy, right? So you need to have, a, again, a holistic view in terms of your talent strategy, uh, your talent tools, your talent uh, methodologies and, and retention, right? It's not just recruitment, otherwise you're going to go crazy because you're going to recruit, but this is going to come out on the other side, right? So you need to have recruitment, retention, development, coaching, uh, cross uh, polarization, and uh, so many other uh, analytics, right? Employee analytics. Uh, it really, I think, when it comes to, to talent, uh, these days, we know there's a massive crunch, there's a massive uh, gap, right? The universities don't generate enough talents for the market. Uh, if you look at some data, uh, you know, in Latin America, 2021, venture capital firms pumped $20 billion into the region, $20 billion, right, from venture capital firms. And uh, it's estimated that by 2025, there will be 10 million new IT jobs. Can you imagine? 10 million, right? New IT jobs in Latin America. So there is no way the universities in Latin America will provide that many graduates for the market, right? There is already a gap, and the gap just keeps growing. Right? So it's not a gap that is getting smaller, okay? So the issue here 
it's a let's say it this is a, a government issue okay this is not just a private sector issue i would like to bring the attention uh, of a truly holistic view in terms of the economy right the economy the development of the region depends on uh, creating more professionals right For, to, to look after the the local markets because what's happening now uh, it's a bloodbath like the article that I would like you to share later, please, uh, with the rest of, uh, of our audience, which is the, the American companies are stealing all of the Latin American talents, right? So the local companies in Latin America, they can't afford the talent anymore because the American companies are paying in dollars. And when you convert to the local currency in Latin America, then the poor local companies uh, the local startups, particularly, right, the smaller ones, because the big ones, they have more budget, but still difficult for them as well. Um, the smaller ones, forget it. I mean, there's no way. So there are massive uh, learning programs that are being created now, uh, for a while now, obviously. You have the education techs, the ed techs, that are graduating more and more developers, which is great, where they're coming out with all of these online courses, like some of them are just obviously a lot of you see a lot of people selling courses online and they're just not great quality. But there's a lot of ad techs that are really amazing, doing a great job, like Rocket Seeds from Brazil is just being bought out by Digital House, which is a, a learning group that has quite a few years now in Argentina. Uh, we have a lot of uh, tribal, we have a lot of really cool, we have Platzi from Colombia, which does all kinds of courses, not just technology, but uh, the issue is, even though you have some of these uh, ed techs and you have some programs uh, coming out of Mercado Livre or of company like Globant or big companies that are investing a lot of money on, on, on generating new IT talent for the markets, it's still not enough. It's still, it's still just a, a raindrop in the ocean. To be honest, I would compare this almost to the environment catastrophe that we have today, right? It's like green energy, man. It's just like we just can't produce enough. We have to triple it. You know, we have to make it ten, tenfold what we're doing now in order to reverse the, the current trend.